I will let you take it. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. All right. I have some slides, but they're mostly to keep me on track. So we'll see. I just do this. Share the whole screen. There we go. All right. Yes. All right, there we go. Mostly to keep me on track. So, hi, thank you all so much for having me. I'm Katie Thompson. I am at the University of Kentucky. I um, have been a faculty member there since 2013, which is the same year I got my PhD. So, I got my PhD um, and then graduated with UK. Um, but I have a PhD in statistics from Ohio State, and then before that was an undergrad math and biology double degree, actually at University of Kentucky. So um, just to kind of give you all a sense of where I started, where some of you may be sitting right now as a math major going, I know I like these things, but what do I do next and how do I navigate this crazy world that keeps telling me all of these opportunities are out there. So um, just curious, how many of you all are undergraduate students? Okay, awesome. How many graduate students? Okay, awesome. Um, for the undergraduate students, how many of you all are math majors? Okay, math related majors? CS? Yeah, I like the kind of. Yeah. CS? Okay, this is CS. What else do we have in the room? Applied math? Computer engineering. Computer engineering, nice. Okay. I saw a computer engineering job posting today. I pulled some job postings to look at with you. I thought that'd be interesting. Um, and then for graduate students, I'm guessing math graduate students. Okay, awesome. So um, I'm, oh, I should stand up here so you all can hear me. Sorry. There you go. Zoom people, can you hear me when I walk away? Yes. Excellent. All right. I'm very loud. So my, <laughs> my colleagues and my students laugh about this all the time. They say they can hear me anywhere on the floor in our building. The microphone's actually right there on the ceiling in front of the podium. Oh, that's fancy. Excellent. Thank you. Clemson's technology is excellent. Okay, awesome. All right. So um, I wanted to tell you all a little bit about STEM and statistics and data science opportunities. Um, so I kind of have a couple of, of slides about career options out there and then some information for especially undergraduates who might be thinking about graduate programs in various fields. Some questions that I recommend asking if you're going to visit places or looking at particular programs. And then I have some job postings. So for graduate students in the room, we're gonna look at some, there's one at least that says PhD in math is one of the qualifications, so I made sure. Um, so you can, I wanna look at a couple of those with you and just kind of show you what I tell students look for with qualifications. So I'll preface this all with like, we all come up from a particular background. And so I may, I have a lot of info for you and slides for you, and then you can take it and do with it what you will and go from there. So um, ask lots of questions all the time. That's always my advice. Get more than one perspective when you're going through what you could do next. So um, one of the things has, have I talked to any of you all before? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you've seen this before. Um, so this slide I kind of pulled and, and just kind of morphed over the years. Um, there was this article that came out on the very, very legitimate site of Mashable.com. Um, that was 10 amazing jobs you could land in STEM. And this came out maybe four years ago, but I just thought it was fantastic because it had some things in it like music data journalists. Those are the people on Spotify who say, if you like this song, I think you'll also like this song. They use machine learning to do that. That's super cool. Is yeah. that a real job title? Wouldn't they just call that like data science? So I think now they do. That's a great question. I think now they would call it data scientist or maybe predictive modeler or something in that realm. This is from before data science existed as a word, which was only like five years ago that I started hearing it maybe. Maybe before that. I don't know. That might not be right. Um, but to yeah, absolutely. Now I've seen different titles on these jobs. Um, EA environmental scanner. This one was cool. This is where they take a droid, uh, not a droid, drone. Sorry, wrong word. Take a drone and they they fly the drone over a golf course and they get data about what the golf course looks like. 
And then there's someone at EA Sports who takes that and makes it a golf course in a video game. I thought that was pretty phenomenally interesting that they use math and computer science to do that. Um, a professional hacker, just, yeah, I just thought that was super cool. Actually, one of our graduate students for his undergraduate computer science thesis project built an app that scraped information from people's publicly available phones nearby. It's very curious and had many questions for him. Um, like, very ethical. Yeah, okay. yeah, I don't know why he was using it for that was ethical, but it had an undergraduate thesis advisor at a university that was not ours. So um, Lego land designer was another one I found super interesting. So all sorts of stuff that I would never have thought was out there that is definitely out there. So I don't really need to tell you all because you're all already in STEM, but there's lots and lots of jobs available in lots and lots of areas for STEM. So here's some statistics. Four of the six uh, best six jobs of 2015 are in STEM fields. Eight of the top 10 jobs for graduate degrees are in STEM fields. Um, three of the top five jobs for the next decade are in STEM fields. And then I have the number of openings and, and graduates that we have hired, I mean, all of our students are having jobs like in hand when they graduate. And so I believe this 1.2 million was available in 2018. I don't know when it is now, but curious to see. So for undergraduates, some things that I think are good to think about as you're trying to decide what's next for you, whether it be careers or graduate school, either way. First one is, do you like math? Which you all are math clubs, so. You like math and pizza, all right? Second one I always ask is, do you like calculus? Do you all like calculus in here? Okay, how many of you like integral calculus more than say multivariate? Cup two, yeah? Do you like them all the same? Yeah. Okay, if you have a favorite, that's always interesting to know. I find that some of my students really like multivariable calculus the best. They also tend to be the best when we look at we have some things we can look at like geometrically and some things we can look at um, with a lot of linear algebra. The students who like Calc 3 the best always tend to like those like geometric representations, which is interesting to me. Um, do you like application areas have a second interest area? That could be computer science, that could be um, biology, that could be uh, social sciences. And then do you enjoy programming? I know we've got CS majors in here. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So as you're thinking about, I'm going to try to do this. Excellent. Questions for you. There we go. That's one of our graduate students, Lee. He is talking to us about using Python within SAS. Um, and he is one of ours that really, really likes the geometric representations, but also is really good at all of the uh, math and notation. So uh, there's a big mix there. The reason I ask you these questions is because when you start looking at what's next, especially with data science just coming down the pipe so strong, with data science in particular, it's really crossing over three areas. One is math, one is like statistics, data, data analysis, and then the third I would say is computer science. And so if you picture like a three circle Venn diagram, you kind of have to pick how much you want to do of each thing. How much do you want to program versus how much do you want to do the theory? How much do you want to do statistics and see real data sets from other people that are an awesome mess a lot of the time versus how much do you want to be the one who's taking the data set from the person who's cleaned it and made it really nice to work with and running algorithms and models on that data set. So there, you can think about kind of where you want to fall in those three categories based on how much you picked up on each of these questions. All right, so for undergrads in particular, grad students will come back the job opportunities, but grad students, I'd love to have your input because you all had to go through this process and decide on a grad school. Um, I should have said as well, please feel free to ask questions anytime. So when you're trying to, if you're thinking about graduate school versus careers within graduate programs, um, there's a different ways to distinguish those things, especially now we're seeing lots of degrees in data science in particular come out. I've seen predictive analytics come out. I've seen all sorts of new stuff. So uh, first one is thinking about a master's versus a doctoral degree. Those can be pretty different types of programs. Um, in terms of careers, it depends on the field. Uh, I have friends in statistics that say, I have a friend with a master's degree who says, yeah, my company, a master's in five years of experience gets you to the same location as a PhD. 
There are other places where you have to have a PhD in statistics in order to do some of the processes. So um, a clinical trial, they pretty much are always looking for a PhD next to a statistician, say I'm on a clinical trial. If you have a master's degree, you can still work on it, but it would be with a PhD statistician. So it just sort of depends on the field. Those things kind of change over time as well. So it's always a little bit fluid, but that's kind of where we are at this point. Um, program requirements can tell you a lot. So we talked a little bit about what you love, the programming part versus the math part versus the data part. If you look at program requirements and they are requiring Calc 2, it's not going to be a mathematical program, right? It's just not going to be. We actually have an applied statistics online master's degree that requires Calc 2. If someone tells me they're a math major, I'm like, okay, let's let's talk about a different program with a little bit more math in it, just because it's it's very different perspectives and very different skill sets. Um, so what, what, what are the goals of people in the, the home to Cal too? What, yeah. what, what, what's the population? Great there? question. Yeah, the population for that program is online program. It's really people who are in a job already at a company and they're getting asked to all of a sudden produce plots, produce bar charts, do analyses. So, so it's things like um, being in a company and then someone's like, okay, take this data set and show us whether you know email a or email b works better for this particular marketing thing we're doing and so it's really people who are trying to complement their current skill set and their current skill set really isn't in statistics they just happen to be the one who liked programming they liked building the tableau dashboards so now they're in charge of that and so it's a lot of people trying to complement existing skill sets versus for you all you're really starting with math and programming skill sets and trying to build onto that for a career. Um, it doesn't, it's a great program for that population. It's just a very different population. So it's Calc 2 for a master's program? For that master's program. I would say most statistics master's programs are going to require um, Calc 3 and a semester of linear algebra. Um, it depends. There are some statistics programs out there that are going to be even more theoretical than that. Data science programs, that's the other way you can distinguish data science programs is they don't typically require Cap three and linear algebra, they require less math than that. Um, I would have to look. But for, for stats, I would say much more typical, right? I can say more typical, but then you'll find three programs without that. But I would say most of the ones that I know are, are cap three and linear algebra. Other questions? Data science is an interesting one. Um, so that leads us to the next one. Program coursework will tell you a lot about a program. So if you're interested in math, looking for a program with theoretical coursework or math coursework, it's going to be really key. If you're interested in programming, then you want a, a program with a graduate program with some programming coursework in it, right? Not just one course, but multiple courses. If you look at a program and it's all a grad, sorry, I'm saying program programming at the same time. If you look at a graduate program and it's all programming coursework, there's not going to be much data, like much statistical analysis, and there's not going to be much theory just based on that. So you can look at the program requirements and see what they emphasize there, and that'll often give you um, an idea of what the program is really going to focus on. Um, I'm the person, I'm the director of graduate studies at UK, which means that I do all of the like, uh, I'm kind of the contact person from prospective students for alumni. Um, and I think for, as I'm like, so we do a lot of just looking at other benchmark schools and seeing what's out there and how we can serve our better, our students better. Um, the sample course plans on websites tend to be helpful for me as I'm trying to figure out, oh, what is so-and-so in size? What is so-and-so in size? Um, because uh, reading graduate bulletins where all of this stuff is laid out is a lot and there's a lot of options out there. Good question. Okay, um, coursework and research balance, which I can talk about statistics. I don't know so much about um, math or CS, but in statistics, you can have programs where you come in and you basically do a year of coursework and you go straight to research and you do research for three to four more years. You can have programs where um, two, to three, two to three years of coursework, I would say two to three years of coursework is probably more typical. And then a transition into research after that. 
Um, you have programs where you start out in coursework, you do some research, and then you continue coursework, and then go back to research. So it just really varies. So if you're someone who doesn't know what you might want to research, but you're thinking you might be interested in a PhD, if you have a program with coursework at the beginning, you basically get your feet wet in all these areas, and you can say, oh, I like that course best. I like that area best. Um, in statistics, it's really common for students to actually not know what they want to research coming in. So they take that first year of coursework, see what they love, and then we sort of pair them off from there. Um, I don't know, in math, would you know what area you want to work in as you come into a math PhD program, or would you come in and like, do prelims before you decide? Um, I think that there are some people that have an idea, but actually, um, I was sort of surprised because I think a lot of people, even in pure math, they they take a year or two to figure out where they're going to specialize. Yeah. It depends on the math on the PhD program. That's um, some yeah. schools do require you to know what you want to research going in because they want you to start research right away. Yeah. Here, um, they you don't need to know yeah. what you want to do yeah. here at Clemson. That's fair, and that's how we are in Kentucky. Like we just really don't think. Um, you know, now there's some more stats, undergrad programs out there, but we have a lot of math, CS, physics, psychology majors coming in. And so I just can't envision a way I would have known, even as a math bio major, what area of statistics I would have wanted to research. I actually remember writing on my application, I want to do uh, statistical genetics or biostatistics, which is like looking at genes and trying to figure out which genes are related to diseases, or theoretical probability <laughs> just like in the realm of statistical phd options is like here and here like that's not the same uh so once i had a year of coursework i i kind of figured out where i wanted that that out to be but i had no idea i do think about now like what is it when the faculty saw that application they must have just gone so but i wish that was me. Yeah. In computer science, they have like bio information and stuff like yeah, that as well. Yeah. And it appears that there's a lot of overlap between statistics and stuff like machine learning and all that. Yeah, definitely. So especially with bioinformatics, there's like bioinformatics and machine learning, and then there's statistics. Um, I would say when I think about a bioinformatics area versus a statistics area, um, statisticians, we're trying to do pretty good most of the time on most of the data sets we see. So we're looking at a data set, looking at a method that's appropriate and trying to figure out, okay, which method is, is going to give us pretty good results all the time, but also results that are more generally applicable. So when we see, um, we see a lot of healthcare claims data sets right now, for instance. So every time you go to the doctor, the doctor has to build some insurance company. Um, and so, you know, especially in states like Kentucky, we have urban areas where like Louisville and Lexington where we are, but we also have lots of areas where there are people who don't have a car and it's an hour to get to a doctor by car, things like that. And so those people just naturally don't go to the doctor as often because it's much, much more difficult. So we do things like look at claims records and say, okay, is there a way we can predict this person's going to be really, really sick based on the information that we do have about them? to see can we help people identify people who might be at risk of diseases earlier on in their trajectories. Um, you know, the, the goal is really like, okay, we know this person is at risk of developing diabetes in the future, and there we know they're going to see the primary care doctor at some point in this two years. The primary care doctor can talk to them about a prevention program that's available in Kentucky. That would be really helpful. So, you know, we might, we might look at, at similar data sets. We're going to look at it and say, okay, how do we try to help um, with this data set and also use that method in other data sets as well for new people, bioinformatics will sometimes look at it and say, okay, how do I get the best machine learning method with the best prediction for this training and validation data set, something like that. So really interesting approaches, sort of different types, uh, different ways of addressing questions. Um, I think for a while I had bioinformatics written on my CV as a research area because I came out doing statistical genetics, looking for SNP that came out of my PhD. I was doing statistical genetics, looking for SNPs, like to quantitative traits, which at the time was sort of in that realm. And then it kind of like the, the research areas are definitely neighboring, but it's a different way of looking at the problem. I, I heard data science actually starting to a colleague about this. He said, yeah, I heard that data science is uh, a data scientist is someone who knows more statistics 
than a computer programmer and they know more computer programming than a statistician. So that's interesting. That kind of like I can kind of see that, right? Like there are some of my stat statistics colleagues that wouldn't do programming, wouldn't be working on, you know, wouldn't be working on computer clusters. And then yeah, just an interesting way to look at kind of what all those skill sets are. All right. Oh, funding. Funding. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, and what research work do you do in statistics without a computer? Because it seems like a lot of that stuff that's related to statistics requires huge access. Like, let's say, you know, you want to find the average income in the U.S., you know, yeah. are you going to work that out by hand? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know? So I actually do work, I work more on the huge data set side. Uh, uh, there's definitely some, like, sometimes what happens with the huge data sets is something comes in and we look at it and we go, uh, we don't have a statistical method for that. Like it just doesn't exist. All the stuff we have makes assumptions that aren't valid or makes assumptions that really just hurt the power of the analysis overall. Um, so we end up going back and trying to develop new methods to analyze those data sets. And when we do that, we actually go back to, to theory. I won't say straight to math because I'm going to have additions, um, but we use a lot of math when we do that. And so um, one of the data sets that we, one of the data problems we had recently was with that claims data, we were working with people on Medicaid insurance in Kentucky, which is for um, a subset of, of Kentuckians who um, are either can't afford or can't get health care for various reasons, and so there's uh, Medicaid insurance for this group of people. So the idea was that we were going to try to um, predict which people were at risk of a certain disease, it happened to be heart failure at some point in the future. Because heart failure is not, not good. And so we wanted to try to, to identify this group of people at risk. Well, we realized really quickly the statistical methods that we had assumed that we observed every person at every time point in our data set. And if we had someone drop their Medicaid insurance for any reason, then the statistical method wasn't going to use them in the analysis. In general, if you've got, you know, 100,000 people in the analysis, you go to 990,000, fine, not a problem, right? We went from 900,000 people in our data set to 400,000. So we started asking this, our partners at um, the state, okay, what happens? Like, why, why are we going from 900,000 to 400,000? Numbers might not be right, but the drop was of that magnitude. And the reason was that there are certain systematic reasons that people can go on and off of Medicaid um, insurance. So it's a very transient group of people. So one reason was um, people with children might sign up for Medicaid at a certain point in the year so that their kids can get all of their vaccinations before they go back to school. That makes sense, right? But then if we drop them from the analysis, that's systematically excluding a whole group of people from the analysis. We can't do that. That would be bad, right? So, so we actually went back to the math and said, okay, what can we do with these missing windows of, of um, data to still be able to make predictions for that group of people? How can we aggregate the data and lose as little information as possible um, in order to still analyze the data? So we went back and um, derived, derived some new equations, did some new simulations, try to figure it out and ended up being able to um, aggregate and at least not drop the people from the analysis overall. So there's one example, stuff like that happens. And there are researchers too who are so actually so far into the probability theory realm that they just don't, don't use computers or it's all very small data sets they can do in-house on a laptop. So we do see that as well, kind of both sides of the data set coin. Any questions? All right, funding, this is a big one. Okay, so when you look at a graduate school, graduate program website, specifically look for funding opportunities. Um, what, for statistics, you might see a mix of things. So there are some programs where PhD students will receive teaching assistantships if admitted. And what that means, typically, you have to look at the program, um, You'll get full tuition coverage, which means resident and non-resident tuition, sometimes called in-state, out-of-state tuition. All that's covered and a living stipend. Um, some programs offer that to master's students. Sometimes it's a subset of master's and PhD students. Um, for us, we any student we admit automatically gets full TA-ship with a living stipend and the tuition coverage. 
Um, and we do um, admit all of our students with the idea that we'll fund anyone who wants to go for that PhD on top of the master's for that full five years. So that varies program to program. If you see on a website, there are no funding opportunities available for this program, means that's not available. No funding, you pay out of pocket, not good, not good. We don't want, I mean, it's fine, right? Like there, I just, I think that being fully informed of that as you're making your decisions is really important. So yeah. What kind of institution would have that? Because it seems to me like, you know, say Clumps is doing research, right? Yeah. They'll pay you to be like a research assistant or something. To yeah. say that there's no opportunities whatsoever yeah. for research or they're, teaching. They're totally going after a market of people that are already employed and their yeah. business will pay for it. Yeah, um, yeah. So sometimes companies will pay for you to get a master's degree on the side. That's a big one. I've heard that. <laughs> there you go. It does happen. But if you're looking, like if you're an undergraduate student and you're looking for a program, that's that's an easy way to kind of like figure out which ones to focus on with funding opportunities. Um, I will be curious to see as more data science programs come out. The, the, I've only looked at, honestly, a couple, but the couple that I've looked at, there have not been funding opportunities on the website. And I don't know if that's uh, across the US. And, and um, so, but I recommend looking on the website. Same for statistics programs. There are statistics programs that R says on our website something actually our website, I'm working on updating, so apologies in advance if you go there. But ours says something like every single admitted master's and PhD student will receive funding, something like that. So you can look for those statements on the website just to help you have that information as you're going. Um, last one on my list is definitely visit schools if at all possible. I know that's hard if you're like talking about going far, but you can always email the program and say, hey, I wanna come visit. Um, sometimes programs are like, sure, like come talk to us. We've got some programs have visit days where they bring in multiple prospective students. Some programs will cover your travel to come see their school for a day. Um, some programs will say, absolutely, we don't have any money for you, but you're welcome to come up. I highly recommend doing that. There's a big difference between looking at a website and being in a building with the graduate students in person. I mean, there's a certain level of difficulty that comes with graduate school, just no matter what. But you want to make sure that you're going to be in a place that's a good fit for you and an atmosphere can go a long way there. So I definitely recommend that. So, and this, some of this will apply to jobs as well. Um, not this one though. So um, let's say you're visiting the graduate program or you're poking around the website or you're, you're talking to someone, talking to a professor. Um, one, here are some questions that, that might be things you could ask. So one is, what are some positions of your recent graduates? So if you know that you want to be a professor and you go visit a school and they say, oh, we have 18 people in industry, right? That's a good hint, right? If you go to a school and they say, we have a mix, we have half go to industry, half go to be professors, great. If you go to a school and they say, they're all going to go be professors, that's great if you want to be a professor. But if you want to go to industry, you want to look for the opposite, right? Look for some positions that look interesting to you so that you know, like, because that really tells you this program is preparing these students to do these things. So that can be a good hint. What do typical assistantship duties entail? Um, so this one will tell you, like, when you're, when you're thinking about a teaching assistantship or a research assistantship, what do those duties look like? Is that standing in front of a group of 30 students three times a week and doing recitation? Is that helping someone in the classroom? Is that grading papers? How does that part of the process work? Okay, that varies a lot year to year, school to school, not year to year, school to school. Um, these are some of our research assistants. They're doing actually that data science project with the Clinton State Health in that picture. Um, do graduate students in your departments receive desk space? I just, I don't know. I find this interesting. Sometimes can be helpful. So um, I went to Ohio State for my PhD. Every graduate student had a desk and shared office. And then as you got further in the program, we went into offices with fewer people. Um, at Kentucky, every student has a shared office, but all our office heads have the same number of desks in them. So it is what it is. Um, yeah. So just a big room with a bunch of desks in it, like crammed together? It depends on the school and the, the program. So at Ohio State, we had like, my mom was a high school math teacher, so I just call it a teacher desk. It's like 
this big, like you couldn't steal it because you can't lift it because it's solid wood, like three drawers on the side and like a pull out tray. We had those. Um, at Kentucky, we have, it's not like this, but it's like usually about twice that big. And we try to make sure everybody has a cubby up above or a drawer down below, just so that your stuff can be the way if you're in and out. Um, so it varies, honestly, by school, even by office. So if you go visit a place, you can say, oh, where do your grad students study? What does it look like? Um, there might be shared study spaces as well uh, that you could see. So it's kind of helpful to know. Could be anything, could be nothing. Could be your study spaces in your apartment. Yeah, just good to know. Then you can ask where study spaces are on campus and where, where grad students typically hang out. Feel free to chime in. I know we have grad students in the room as well. Do you all have desks here? There you go. Is it like the big teacher desk? Or is it like, yes, big teacher desk. There you go. Now I can say that's common to have big teacher desks, right? And a three is totally fine. Yeah, ours come with asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't they up with asbestos? And I think it's Daniel Hall. Come on. Um, it's funny. Yeah, I mean, it's not funny, but my, my um, graduate department was in a building that was like 110 years old. The one at UK, our building was redone 15 years ago. So I walked into interview and they were like, one of the professors was like, sorry, it's so something. And I was like, this is so nice, like <laughs> everything's so cool. But uh, even Ohio State, absolutely love. Uh, what computing resources are available? If you know you want to do big data sets, big computing stuff, it's good to know what um, options you're going to have available to run that code, right? So whether departments have clusters, whether colleges have clusters, universities have clusters. Um, whether you get your own computer as a grad student, whether you can ask for that, whether that's something that comes later on, um, any of that can be really helpful. Um, it just varies highly department to department. I tried to put pictures on every slide. I think I did all but one. What does your something look like? Sorry, I forgot what that was. Oh, comp exam structure. That's a good one to know as well. So what does your comprehensive exam structure look like? It varies quite a bit in statistics right now. We're seeing programs go from like, um, we're just seeing programs change it up. And so if you're looking specifically at statistics programs, you might have an exam after first year, you might have an exam after first and a half year, you might have exams after first and second year, um, but just kind of knowing what that structure looks like is a way to distinguish programs as you're looking. In math, I don't know. No freelance. So, I didn't take comprehensive actually. Yeah, it was, there were just oral exams. Oh, gotcha. But most math graduate programs have a sequence of comprehensive. Exams. Okay. Okay. So that's one way you can you can kind of line out what a progression for a program is going to look like. What is it like to live in your city? Um, I just I think. You know, when you go to grad school, if you go to grad school, you end up spending a lot of time on grad school. Same thing for careers, right? You move to a city for a job, you're going to spend a lot of time at your job. But you're also going to have a life outside your job or a life outside your grad school. And so you want to make sure that you're in a place where you can be happy. And so I highly recommend visiting places. I highly recommend asking around what it's like to live in the town, city, location that you're thinking about moving. Um, it's, yeah. It's a good thing. It's important. So question to ask. Okay, question so far. All right, so the next thing I did is a little dangerous. I don't know, I hope not dangerous. So I, one of the things I've noticed is like our graduates get hired into jobs under titles of statistician, data scientist, data analyst. We have someone who's called a master specialist at Deloitte Consulting. I was like, Rebecca, what does that mean? And she said, oh, basically I'm in the data science track, but I manage a team of people. So they had to make a special job title. So I'm called a master specialist. And I was like, oh, okay. So you're in charge of data scientists. And she was like, like, when you oh, say okay. graduates, are these undergraduate, graduate, or graduate? These are graduate graduates. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I did was I went to that point that 
Um, I pulled job postings from literally indeed.com. I just took screenshots. And so there's some that are bachelor's, some master's, some PhD, just to kind of show you what the postings look like and so and what the job titles are. Um, and kind of go through it when when a student brings me a posting and says I'm thinking about applying for this job, just kind of things I look for with students. So we'll see how this goes. All right, so the first one, oh, and just for fun, I lived within 50 miles of Clemson, South Carolina. So this is in a place called Anderson. Okay. Oh, I see some laughing. Um, yeah, we all know where that is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, exactly a very wealthy place. Oh, good. Okay. It's a nice place in, in South Carolina. Yeah. Okay. So it's in Anderson. Less than 50 miles from here, I can tell you that. All right, so this is a data scientist position at a company called Human Technologies Incorporated. I have no connection or net, nothing to these companies. They're literally the top things that came up on Indeed. So that's where I got them. Um, so this one is a data scientist that makes $60,000 a year as the salary. Um, and it says knowledge in visual analysis, data analysis, statistics, data mining, all one thing, and machine learning. That's interesting. So next thing I do, I, I asked you to, when I look at these postings, is look at what the responsibilities are, which, sorry for the font size. Um, this is all of the, the things the person's asked to do. It includes things like use descriptive statistics to summarize the overall picture. Okay, Provide means and standard errors. That's how I read that, right? Um, let's see, clean and organize raw data from different sources. Okay. Um, Visualization of data analysis, creation or use of machine learning models for predictions, evaluation of statistical models, determination of the validity of the analysis. That's a lot of stuff, right? That's a lot of stuff. Um, then I, I scroll down to the bottom, and under the qualifications, it says a four year degree preferred in data science, statistics, mathematics, computer science. I think the last one was. I forgot. I'll have to look it up. Something else. You usually put like engineering and gym. Yeah, exactly. STEM related field. I've yeah, seen that so. recently. Yeah. So interestingly to me, like that's a lot of statistical skills to be able to do, but the the degree qualification is four years. So when I'm when I'm looking at these postings with students, I usually tell them go over and see how many of those bullets like are interesting to you first. That's a good idea. If it's all about like this is a lot about working with data sets. So if you know you want to be the person who's creating the methods and doing the mathematical part, this one's going to be really applied, right? The other interesting thing is the, the four-year degree. Some of them you'll see will say four-year degree. Some of them will say other stuff. So let's go to the next one. A senior statistical programmer at a place called Everest Clinical Research. Um, perform independent validation of data sets created by other programmers or statisticians and develop SAS programming codes to independently validate statistical somethings. Different type of job, very different type of job. This is um, looking at data sets another statistician has created and making sure all is okay. Um, a lot of bullet points. The thing that, that was interesting to me about this is the emphasis on SAS. Um, I do still see that with our graduates who go to um, pharmaceutical industry in particular use a lot of SAS. We do have some of those graduates using our other things now as well, but a lot of them use SAS. So it's interesting. Uh, the job, the salary range for this one is $96.4 thousand dollars a year to $122,000 a year, um, which is interesting compared to the last one that we just saw for $60,000 a year. But this one is a master's in computer science or math or statistics with at least five years of experience. So there's the reason. For Did it also say it was remote? Yes, also remote. Right. So you can take that 122 and look to Anderson and look like a king. Yeah. <laughs> so we actually have students now who are getting remote jobs like in New York City, but they're remote. So they can live in Lexington, Kentucky on a New York City salary. Great for statisticians, data scientists, and mathematicians. So the remote thing is it's becoming, and I really, I've been seeing this actually since COVID. I don't know when it started, but but coming out of COVID, um, 
our graduates are definitely more evenly balanced between remote positions and in-person positions. It used to be that students would, would start with where they were willing to move or not willing to move, which could be anywhere. Um, but now they're starting with remote versus in-person and going from there. It's a choice, and that I don't know another way to make that choice other than personal preference. All right, this one is a uh, quality engineering statistician at a place called Polymed, also in Anderson, South Carolina. Um, this is kind of like a general posting. Uh, I pulled it because it had the word engineering and the word statistician in it, which I found interesting. So it has these responsibilities of quality engineer, which this may just be that they pulled their quality engineer posting and put it under statistician. I'm not sure. But this one has a minimum of five years of experience with quality systems management in the medical device industry. That is to me would be very specific to an undergraduate or a graduate coming out of a graduate program, right? Um, I don't, this one's called statistician, but I'm not sure exactly where the statistics are in that particular posting. It would be one that our students would have to first know medical devices, which is probably unlikely. And then second, they would have to like go to the interview and ask, what am I going to do? Do a yeah. lot of these um, advertisements have uh, like required and inferred. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. The ones I was seeing had like a list of required. I, on the required skills, those lists tend to be so long. Um, I always say aim high. It might be that they're putting out eight skills and they really want three and you just don't know which three they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I always tell students like, Worst thing happens is they just shift you into the no pile, shift your resume into the no pile, and keep going. Um, so, so this one in particular, these were all required. It's like, I don't know a statistician that has five years of experience in the technical quality systems management right. side of the medical devices. So what you're saying is you might as well roll the dice anyway if you've got some of that skill set. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Definitely, definitely, yeah. Oh, um, I'd say this all, and um, I, I, I'll need to head out in just a moment here. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. I, I, th I thought I'd throw this out here. So um, when I was coming out of undergrad, I just on a whim went to a career fair, and I happened to talk to um, some people at, at an organization called Fisher Homes. Yeah. Um, they're, so they're pretty well known in Kentucky. Yeah. And um, I actually ended up getting a job offer from them. But the thing, it was for a position that they didn't really have have advertised at that point, but they just said, hey, we talked with you. You seemed like you had a decent head on your shoulders. Can you apply, please? Yeah, yeah. And so I said, okay, sure, why not? Yeah. And so in any case, um, I just wanted to give an example there where, I mean, it was a position where I didn't I didn't meet every, every bullet point on their list exactly, but they had spoken with me in person. Yeah. And so um, from that, sometimes that can be a benefit of going to um, going to in-person events and, and meeting recruiters in person. And, you know, the online benefit is that you can uh, hit a wide swath of companies, but then, you know, you can hit 50 companies in half an hour and do LinkedIn quick apply. Uh, but but um, anyway, I thought I'd throw that out yeah. there for, for people. Just that's an experience that, um, you know, happened. So. That's a great, that's a great point. I know UK has career fairs as well, and it can be really helpful, especially when you're talking about data, statistics, this kind of stuff. Sometimes companies don't really know what they need. They just know that they have this new new thing that they're trying to use to their advantage. They don't really know how to do that. So sometimes it may be that you show up at the table and you say, oh, that's interesting. I, I have this other perspective about that. And then they reach out, which is awesome. Yeah. yeah they, thank you again so much for your time. It's me. It's me. Awesome. Okay. So all right, this is the last one, I believe. This is NFA Entry to Expert Level Virtual Hiring Event, which I think is the reason for the salary raise, or salary range, sorry, 74 to 176 thousand a year. Um, so this one is uh, data scientist roles within the NSA. I thought this would, ah, you can't see that at all. Um, but so uh, this posting, the first sentence is data science at NSA is a multidisciplinary something that uses elements of mathematics, statistics, computer science, and application-specific knowledge to gather, make, um, and communicate conclusions from data. 
It's like, that's pretty broad, right? Like that's pretty broad. So I scrolled down to their qualifications. Their qualifications were a PhD in math, computer science, or statistics across the board. All right. Now this one granted is some sort of like hiring event fair. So it is a little bit more broad, but that was one where I saw those three bubbles that we were talking about at the beginning really kind of all come into play. So I found that really interesting. So these exist out there too. Yeah. Yeah, and, and they definitely do like fellowshipping things once you get there where you okay. go through your program yeah. and you know they, they have a lot of training for you like once you get there. Yeah. So they they yeah they take you from where you yeah, are yeah, and they take you from where you are and like we're gonna yeah. give you some new stuff. So. Exactly. And that's the other reason to roll the dice. I mean, you know, I have students come to me and say there's this really cool job, but it's in this specific field I don't know anything about. I'm like, that's all right, they don't know anything about data. It's probably fine, right? Like you'll learn from each other. So we'll come in and help with some of that subject specific stuff. Most yeah. of the time they're posting that job thing because they actually need it filled and they have a deadline. Yeah. So if you're just the best candidate yeah. at the time where they say the project's gonna get delayed if we don't have this person yeah. on, yeah. they're gonna hire you. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. You're, you're their best option. Exactly, exactly. There's a lot about job searches that has to do with not not one specific person, which is always crazy. Um, and, and also on that note about, you know, the, when the opening is there, when it's being filled and some of these kind of like take you from where you are and build your skill set programs, there are programs out there at, um, other places as well. So we had a graduate go to NASA. She knew nothing about space. I asked her, I was like, what's your undergrad degree? She's like, economics. Okay. She went to NASA with a master's in statistics and went to their like one year, they have like a one year kind of program and now does, um, data analysis and projects for them at NASA and statistician, which is cool. And she said she doesn't know, like when people come to her, they just say, we have this question about this thing and they do work with space stuff. So I'm not a, I'm nowhere near astronomy. I didn't even have a course in it. Um, and then she has to kind of like figure out what statistical method might be best to analyze that data and how to do that. But it's in, uh, a setting where she has other people around to ask and so ask questions. So as you're looking for jobs and talking to companies, um, thinking about whether you want that sort of teamwork setting where you have mentors built in and, and teams of people ready to help versus are you gonna be okay being the only statistician or data person in a company? We had a student get an offer once from a super, it was a pet food company in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. It's like, are you interested in that job? It's like, it's in the middle of nowhere, Illinois. I don't know. And so he was going to be the only person that he was going to be the data person and statistician at the company. So everything from data collection to interpretable output. And it just wasn't well, right for him. So he turned that down and had another offer within two months. I think an offer May after he graduated, something like that. Um, so, so thinking about kind of what environment you work best in can be really helpful as well. All right. Oh, there's one more. This one was a statistician, uh, sorry, a data scientist position for a company called First Quality. Um, first bullet on the list mentioned AI and machine learning business outcomes, and then it was a lot about trying to communicate results to stakeholders and that sort of thing. This is a case where primary responsibilities include, and it was like 25 things. So looking through that list and figuring out, okay, are some of these interesting to me? If they are sending out the resume, then in the interview trying to nail down, is this job gonna be something that you might truly enjoy? Really important. Ah, this is the PhD or master's position in stats, math, or computer science, or another related discipline. So, They've got a pretty broad, broad reach there in their posting. Um, I have had students say too that things like career fairs um, can be more helpful than than online stuff just because of the face time. I don't honestly know on that one. I'm just kind of waiting to see. I've seen do both, and then I just am really happy when they get jobs and they all get jobs. Um, all right, so then. Um, Last thing I wanted to put on your all's radar. So um, there are things out there to help, especially really both undergrads and grads. This one in particular is for undergrads. Um, 
kind of help figure out where in data science, statistics, computer science you might be interested. Um, so one of the things that we do is we run a program called Statistics Undergraduate Research Experience, which is basically a conference within a bigger conference. So the bigger conference is like uh, the Gordon Research Conferences. Oh my goodness, I don't care about those. Okay. So it's kind of a setting where you have um, fewer people at a conference. So like our big statistical conference has 6,000 statisticians at it usually every year. That's a lot if you're like trying to go figure out what you should do next. Um, so this one has like 100 people at it every year. Um, so we actually get NSF funding to bring undergraduates to that conference. I'm actually headed there after this. So that's exciting, um, but we are running it every year. So I wanted to put a plug out there. If any of this kind of stuff is helpful to you all, um, definitely let me know. We started having a really, really strong interest from students who want to come to this. And so we're hoping to be able to expand it and run it more than once a year, um, but we will see how that goes. So if you're interested, you're welcome to send me an email and I'll definitely send you a note when we get our expansion plan figured out, whatever that might be. Uh, but there's a, a picture of all of our, this was actually the first year we ran it in Carrollton, Kentucky, which is halfway between Louisville and Lexington. That is where it is. <laughs> uh, okay, so there's references and contact information. Um, I'm happy to, wow, I can't believe it's already 552. Mm -hmm. I talk a lot. <laughs> So I'm happy to answer questions, talk more. Um, I did bring flyers for UK. We are actually in the process of revising our graduate program to put more real data experience into it. So I do have that if anyone happens to be interested, I can give you one um, or answer any other questions. And graduate students, I would love to hear any helpful advice that you have. So we can share that with those here and then I can take it with me. <laughs> well, first let's thank you. Any comments, questions, feedback from grad students? Anybody say all oh, this is wrong? That's fine. <laughs> no, 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 those were all the things I wish I would have asked. So. Really? Yeah, okay. those, are, those are all really great questions. I actually really appreciate you saying that because I'm like, this is what I would wish I would have asked, but I am like a sample size of one, right? Like what matters to me may not at all matter to you all, and that's okay. Yeah. But just kind of thinking about it before you get there. It also helps because sometimes programs will be like, here, meet with five people one on one. You know? I don't know what to do. <laughs> so there's the words here. Yeah. You know, I, I, my opinion is uh, students in STEM oftentimes kind of best and brightest, in my humble opinion. Uh, but one thing that sometimes we forget about is you need to be willing to market yourself a little bit, right? So don't expect things to fall on your lap. You know, the, the story that, that he told before, you know, going to that career fair and, you know, just kind of pressing the flesh and talking with somebody, that that, that opens up a, a surprising amount of doors. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Asking lots of questions. Y'all are welcome to, I mean, you're welcome to email me anytime about any, I don't know about uh, outside of stats, data, graduate programs, but anything in that realm, I don't know, I'll tell you, I don't know. Um, and if not, I have colleagues who, um, one of my colleagues was the chair of all of the statistics department chairs for the U.S. for a while, so he knows about all the graduate programs. So we are happy to give unsolicited advice or solicited advice um, if you're trying to navigate that world or just things like, I don't know what to ask or what do you think about this? Um, definitely let us know. We're happy to help and we want you to do what's right for you at the end of the day. I think it's also interesting. Another thing to look at if you're looking at graduate programs and statistics is another, and this is, this can change the flavor of it. There are some statistics that are actually in a in a department or in our case, a school with mathematics, yeah. Yeah. like here. Uh, there are some places where it's actually set. I believe it's separate. It's separate, UK. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think that sometimes that will give a different flavor. It does. You know, so it does. Yeah. It's just good to know going into it. That's all I have. Any other questions, comments? I just right, well, want to you. say that oh. um, middle of nowhere, Illinois, isn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <I'm laughs> so, do you know this this pet food company that we were talking about? I don't know which one it was. 
don't recognize the pet food company, but I yeah. live in uh, Champagne, so. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's actually, my, <laughs> my dad actually was going up to Champagne for a while building something. I don't know if it was a parking complex or something. Awesome. Well, there you go. See, now you know, middle of nowhere, Illinois, you can email Dakota and ask what it's like. <laughs> there you go. Other questions? Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Appreciate you staying. Thank you all out there for showing up. Uh, hold on to your hats. Uh, next week, there will be another map of that probably yours too. Uh, you're through with speaking, so I'll give you an excuse to run away. So, anyway, everybody have a good weekend and stay dry. Flyer? Yeah. See y'all later. Any questions?